Next, our next speaker is Professor Wen Yong currently the President's Chair in Computer Science and Engineering at NCU. He has also served as the Associate, Associate Dean's Research at College of Engineering since 2018 and has served as the Acting Director of Nanyang Technopreneurship, Technopreneurship Center. He received his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science minor in Western Literature from MIT. He has worked extensively in applying machine learning techniques to, to system prototyping and performance optimization for large scale network computer systems. Hopefully, that was fun. There was a whole new study in the top of the top of the top of the top And uh, it's a great honor to uh, find a chance uh, uh, to work with my old time friends, uh, Dr. Ivo. We knew each other of the uh, since 1994. It's like 20 years. years. And we went to MIT together as well. And we went to the same undergraduate school in China and then we went to MIT. And our past used to be only a cost when we want to cook together. Uh, I know how to cook uh, noodles and Dr. and I will know how to cook uh, some vegetables, very famous vegetables at the moment. And now we have like 28 years later, we start to think about similar ideas or similar things. And uh, last year, when we first came to Singapore, he talked to me, he told you me, know, do you know about the twin? I said, Stichel twin, that's my DNA. <laughs> uh, just your fact that I was working on Stichel twin research. And how do you first time heard about Stichel twin? Stichel twin actually, in very simple terms, refers to, uh, then he first use this uh, uh, scientific definition, then we talk about more layman terms. Scientific definition of your twin, it is about the scale of the physics simulator of physical system, including both the physical elements as well as the dynamic processes associated with that as a complicated process. But, but put that aside, digital twin is basically an avatar or a digital replicate of either your imaginary stuff or the physical stuff in the world. It could come from both your you know, stuff in your imagination, the movie art, or stuff which exists in our physical world, and that is how we talk about the digital universe, the infrastructure map into the digital print space. So that's the uh, topic of today's talk. The cognitive digital digital print process that I want to That's my research. Uh, something as we all know over the last couple of years because of the uh, because of the growth of the digital economy, our Singapore is not the digital economy. And our has driven the data growth over the uh, last couple of years and is further accelerated by the COVID 19 situation. We have to work from home, study from home, uh, everything is from home. And as well as online. So as we talk, we see tremendous growth in terms of in terms of data assets that this year, and let's say share of that 2020 worldwide will derive 64 terabyte data set, a data generated. And by 2025, we expect that the data amount will be 180 terabyte. What do you mean? Do you know what's that theta? Theta this means 10 to 24. That's a huge number. That's a what I call you know, astronomy numbers. And the top of this data is to be processed, stored, communicate, compute, visualize. Now all of this requires to requires to use servers. You may talk about servers. So it's just a high-end computer you put into a closet or you put into a small room or you put in a whole building data center. We call that data center. It is a building, a subset of building, or a group of building we use to house computer equipment. Uh, this thought is uh, quite naive, but actually it's a very complicated process. As we see more data, we see more data center going around, and there's a huge growth in the data center as well. Last uh, couple, the last couple of years. And it was estimated that data center has been growing uh, annual growth like 15 to 25%. Let me just use an example. In Singapore, uh, our 
our building or one of his areas and hub in the South region. Uh, we see tremendous growth uh, over, over the time. And as a result, uh, we see some trying to support particularly this data center operations would consume huge amount of electricity to run these servers as well as the police. So that amount of data it consumes is beyond your imagination. Just as an example, one square feet of space in data center will consume 500 or 1,000 times more than electricity one would consume at all. And just here has some uh, additional numbers I want to share with you. So, Google was 2020, data center consumes about roughly 2% of all the electricity. By 2025, that number is over 5%, in 2013, only 8%. That means 8% of our electricity will be consumed by data center. And in Singapore, we are even better. 2017, I did the national survey, realized that data center consumes roughly 7% of our electricity. And by 2028, we expect that number is going to reach 12%. Of course, our government in 2019 decided to put the moratorium on new data center here. And that lasts for two years, and early this year, our government had a new plan to have to open up the, the uh, data center uh, bills. But still, that should not slow down the data center consumption, uh, the energy consumption. And this huge amount of energy being consumed in the data center, they generate heat. And this heat tends to bring down the solar. So we have to extract this heat using air cars. As our founding father said, air car is the most beautiful invention of the best invention of what is really in Singapore next to an equator. And so that's the same thing. We need a huge amount of coal energy to extract the heat from the inner center on, from the solar, so that the solar can stay in the same kind of conditions so they will not break down. Because otherwise, any single breakdown gives them a huge financial implications. Typically, one breakdown or one outage of data is going cost you $1 million easy. That's even 5 percent years ago. Now this number can be because that. So therefore, we have to want to our program is slow. That means we have a lot of wastage because in the other part of the world, we don't need such a huge icon to put down my server. And in Singapore's context, uh, roughly 40% of the energy consumed in data center is used for cooling. 40%. And that's huge amount of energy consumed for cool down the data center. Not only that, there's a tremendous wasted in that process. We can use it, uh, we can think about uh, where the waste can uh, uh, come from. In order to keep a very uh, stable climate within data hall, we tend to overcool these servers and use a step set off. So, but at the same time, the IT load will can change. So therefore, we're using a fixed provision to address a volatile load. So you see these gaps here. That's the worst thing. Roughly, you see that context, the 35 to 40 percent of these cooling managers are being wasted. So how do we do? How do we reduce this wasted? Very simple. I, I, just like we want to call, we turn on the air con when we at home. If you're not at home, there's no one at home, you can turn on air con. But inside the data center, something cannot easily be done. This is like a lot of other concerns. So, people talk about using just in time cooling. Especially, you cool the server only in response to the IT load. You, you're cooling the plastic or you're cooling the load actually right on your IT load. But in order to do so, you will need a lot of data to understand and predict what your IT load may be. Then you pre-configure this 
mechanical systems, after this mechanical system will respond to your ID systems dynamics. That's a really difficult problem to do. Mechanical system are very long for game time, in the minutes. ID system has time constant, not a second. No, you trying to ask a hand, the southern hand gorilla to do stitch. Uh, that's very difficult, right? What you want to do, you want to use data, you want to use much money in the AI. But that's what we believe we need to do. But in order to use AI for this context, we have two major issues. First, the data we collect from the current data center operators is not good enough. Why I say the data quality is not good enough? There are two reasons. First, data collect our sensors could have noise. And second, the data collected by the real operations are not have sufficient coverage because all the data, all the data set has to be operated within a certain range by ASCII standard. So therefore, for example, you operate it to 7 to 21 degree. So your operating data will not have data center, uh, will, will not have the signal when you operate it in 25 degree. If you don't have the data, AI cannot, cannot learn, right? cannot do anything about it. So if I not see it, I will not be able to uh, optimize it. So therefore, data is a major issue here. And second, is the data center is a this uh, data center is mission critical for business operations. So the operators often have this risk of this mindset. So basically, if there's no issue, I don't want to cut my system, I don't want to make changes as well. That's the risk adverse mindset. So you may not have a good knowledge, good things you want to deploy, you may not be able to adopt because of this risk adverse mindset. So, what's your view? Actually, this question I've been asked a lot of times when I start to work on data center research. And then one day I thought, yeah, maybe I can use digital code. That's where digital can come from in my coming to the uh, data center research and mission to infrastructure as well. Digital code is the digital vertical methods called asset. It has certain capability can simulate the operational data. It can also validate whatever recommendation by the AI or machine learning models before I deploy to the physical system. Such that my operators can make informative decisions on whether I want to implement that policy or not. That's the two uh, digital tools. Therefore, digital tools serve these two purposes to address the charity legislature. First, digital tools can simulate real operational data for my model training purpose in AI applications. That's why. Second, Digital can also validate recommendations or policy control actions in the digital model before I deploy them into the physical model. That provides sufficient information for operators to decide they want to talk or not. So this serves the main problem. So that shows the importance of the information. That's we we'll connect with the uh, 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 metaverse exchange, uh, the finance exchange. So, digital tool can provide really high quality information and data about the underlying asset. They even can provide information that do not exist in the physical world. I can simulate, synthesize the data provide more insight than you can get from the physical asset. And this information will, could play a very important role to advise or facilitate the, uh, the financial investor, uh, support the operators, support the uh, 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 certificate uh, issuer. So this information could be the same for all of them. So that's the importance of having digital tool in uh, mission critical asset management. So you can provide the data and you can do the just like what 
to go to the top area and go drive up. For any accident, I will take on this asset. I can go to drive up on my physical model, uh, on my physical model before I have to be in the physical model, right? So that capability gives us the and the advantage to run mission critical infrastructure. So I think uh, this one that we've done over the last couple of years uh, to use to open and AI to get them to operate the data center in a more intelligent manner. So let me show one example we did for one of our uh, partners in Singapore. This part of the data center, I think of 1.7 uh, megawatt, um, not the total size capacity is 2.7 megawatt. And the only part of the human staff for one is one. And you can guess this is a small enterprise data center. Uh, so we use AI and future model to run this data center. We reduce the out of three from 1.57 to 1.37. A few years it just assume that some numbers. And this problem time is translated to half a million dollar saving in electricity bill. Half a million dollars. Normally it will cost like that. Two or two or five million dollars a year for electricity. They save half a million. And also we reduce the carbon emission of this data center operation around 2,000 tons. And this is for uh, each data world to reduce carbon emission around uh, 1,000 tons. So, and then if we extrapolate this data to all the data centers in Singapore, here's the number I got. I got this from my research team today. So, if we extrapolate this number to all the data centers in Singapore right now, so it will be Without one, the image of the electricity saving of close to 900 gigawatt hour per year, and also cover the platform of uh, 370 kilotons per year. This number sounds really good to our uh, government agencies, IBA, ECA, AEA, and, and the largest numbers to what we see this as well. And for just one reason, for coming on, so this is our coming issue, not be related to, uh, translated to 270,000 passenger vehicles drives per year, and not be uh, 224,000 homes coming emission a year. So that's not the size of Singapore, if I understand correctly. And also, if you want to capture this amount of carbon, you probably pay off by the size of Singapore land of trees to see on the show is carbon or cut this carbon from the air. So this impact one possible to achieve with this technology in the mission critical infrastructure in the center. And a similar concept and ideas can be applied to other mission critical uh, infrastructure assets which uh, now talk about uh, lost a lot all these Asset infrastructures, you know, ranging from the uh, buildings like this one, uh, the power plants, and the oil and gas field, chemical, uh, uh, chemical uh, plants, or even the airports, and also the port operations as well. We are working with all these different sectors, what I call mission critical facility. We use similar approach to address the uh, sustainable challenge as well as operational issues. And the approach we introduce is using digital twin to get with the AI component. In other words, we need to use AI, but that comes to uh, challenge issues. So therefore, we introduce this digital twin into this frequent uh, synthetic uh, synergy solution called uh, cognitive digital twin. Can address these challenges. And actually, another side benefit of using this digital twin and AI is in a safe carbon emission. Just for doing this uh, uh, experiment at a lot. Before this, when I want to test some new technology, I have to give the test back or I could run the experiment in my physical uh, uh, infrastructure. That costs actually uh, result in carbon emission. But if I do a total AI, I can run this in the 
rotation pattern, all by simulation. And that you will get the calculation. If you compare, I run my own physical uh, experiment, or, or just do this computational stuff, the amount of carbon savings is 25,000 times less if I do it the digital compared to doing the physical. That's huge, huge saving because we see a lot of our partners, they are realized that by, by the design and everything else, uh, do this uh, uh, fitting that they, they can use this to do serious stuff as well as well to save huge amount of carbon emission as well. Uh, so that's actually uh, bring up a different concept which I call digital first, or something else called more digital. Two times, I prefer digital first, and some of my, my friends uh, prefer uh, more digital. But we all use the same arena called the industrial metaverse. I will mix them in metaverse, from the metaverse mentioned too. Industrial methods, basically use the methods approach to address these industrial applications. And I call digital first, especially from the design, build, operate, to take, uh, to, uh, maintain such a safety condition. I can do this in the digital space first. I can do all this planning, I can do all this, you know, you may call it in the military, but you do all this in the digital space. And in the digital space, you can do this even beyond the physical law. Right? So, and another example is that with, uh, uh, Google work with the uh, EPA will have this new way of control. Uh, Dr. Bagas Bailey probably is the fusion plans. <laughs> they use AI and drill to do that experiment, but they build in the fusion plan to have to do the experiment. You cannot do that. Too costly, too risky. You build your to, to do that research, to do all the testing. So I think that's also what I call digital first. I have to do everything in digital if I do the physical. So uh, that's a, a, I foresee in the future that no matter the snow that will come in the part of our life, we will have more of this opportunity to work with this digital model first before we get into the physical reality of the world. And so with that, I have to my, uh, my, my, my journey, I hope that gives you uh, some rough idea of what I hope that I mean by digital work, uh, what were my data set, and how that connects to each other, and how that connects to digital, uh, how connect to metaverse and uh, the industrial metaverse. Thanks. Thank you.